One can ask the question, how does something that happened nearly 2,000 years ago have any bearing on me? How can Jesus' death affect my life? Paul is explaining in the book of Romans why he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed by faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. The gospel is not just an historical event, but it is something that transforms the life of those who believe. So, when we believe in Jesus, we are justified by the blood of Jesus. And God gives us his Holy Spirit, so that God's love is poured out into our hearts. And we have an expectation of the future. And it is this change in position, change in perspective, that has a tremendous effect on the way that we live our lives. So what happened 2,000 years ago is tremendously important to you and me today. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. My name's Arthur and I thank you for joining me as we share this practical outworking of the gospel what it actually means in the life of a believer. When we accept that Jesus died for our sin and ask Jesus to come into our heart, but it's not the mechanical process that we are talking about or the mechanical process of baptism. It's actually believing, and that's where the emphasis is, believing in Jesus. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So, we must believe in Jesus. But having believed in Jesus, do we continue to live in sin? Some would argue, well, if God's grace is magnified by forgiving our sins, why don't we commit more sins so that God is seen to be more gracious? No, Paul is saying God's grace is to rescue us from sin, not that we should continue in it. So the transaction of the gospel involve the death of Jesus and that death is accounted as our death. Our sins were carried to the cross and he was punished for our sin. So if we believe that, it is logical that we are not going to continue to live in sin but we're going to live in obedience to Christ because we account the death of Jesus as our death and the life of Jesus as our life. 
In New Testament times, it was normal for Christians, when they became believers, to be baptised. This happened on the day of Pentecost, and this was a rite that the Lord Jesus endorsed. He was himself baptised by John the Baptist. His disciples were baptised most by John the Baptist, and they baptised many others. And baptism is a symbolic act of repentance, and of death, burial, and of resurrection. So when we are baptised, and we are placed under the water, it's a picture of being buried. When you bury a person who's dead, then you dig a hole and put them under the earth. But resurrection is when the grave is opened and the person comes out again. And when a person comes up out of the waters of baptism, that's a picture of resurrection. It's a new life that they begin to live, symbolised in baptism. So, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we should walk in newness of life. When God's Spirit comes upon us, he empowers us to live this new life. We have been united with him in the likeness of his death through baptism, and we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. The old way of living, focused on self, is to die. And the new way of living, focused on Jesus Christ, is our new basis of living. He says, so that we should no longer be slaves of sin, but we have been freed from sin. The point of sin is that it confines us to death. But we've already died and risen again in Christ. So sin has no more power over us. Yes, we still do fall short and do acts which are wrong. But when these things happen, we are not looking forward to condemnation. We believe we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. So death has no longer dominion over him. And He died for sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've talked about imputing sin and righteousness. This is an accounting type term, and this reckoning is an accounting type term. The legal standing that we have as Christians is that Christ died for us, therefore we have died, our sins have been paid for, he rose for our justification, therefore we are justified before God and we can live for God. We are no longer under condemnation and we are to live our lives on that basis. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, if we reckon that we are alive and sin no longer has control, we are to not allow sin to rule our bodies, that we should obey its lusts. We are still in the body, and the body still has lusts, and they will be pressuring us, as they always have, to do certain things. But we have been saved from slavery to our bodies, that we might live for God. And so we don't present our members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but we present ourselves to God as being alive from the dead. Each morning we can get up and we can say, Lord, I commit to you this day. I am your servant that I might do the things that please you. Or we can just carry on with our old life and not enter any of the blessings and grace that is available to us because we've become believers in the Lord Jesus. He says, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. We're not controlled by the law. God deals with us according to his grace and kindness, and our response is to choose to serve God with our members, by doing good to all men, especially the household of faith.